Uh, we have a full service today, and that's good. Um, we uh, have a supersonic uh, fighter pilot guest preacher today, so you make sure you reach down and fasten your seat belts. We'll go quickly. You do have an extra hour today, so it's okay. Uh, we'll make believe we're in our sister church in Haiti. They may uh, have two or three hour long services. So if you need to get up and stretch your legs, God bless you. It's okay. That's good. Well, it's an honor to speak today. I really appreciate it. Uh, Have you ever asked yourself the question, is it possible to be a committed believer, a Bible-believing follower of Christ, and still honorably serve as a policeman or a soldier in the military? You know, our church has been blessed with a quiver full of young people. For these young people, we so dearly love Someday they may choose to serve in uniform. We must ask the questions. Do they choose an honorable occupation? Doesn't the Bible say, thou shalt not kill? Didn't Jesus teach that you must love your enemies? Didn't he teach, blessed are the meek? Aren't we supposed to turn the other cheek? So uh, this is a heavy message today. Uh, I want to invite you, if you don't have other plans... To come over to my house. Uh, I can offer you chips and drinks, but if you'd like to come and fellowship out by the pool, it should be a nice day. Uh, you can go to Subway's or the pizza place and come and be guest at my house. I'd be delighted to host you there anytime this afternoon. For just a few moments today, I want to look at a heavy subject um, God, the military, and the use of lethal or deadly force. This subject we face today can be a very difficult one with thorny questions. So aren't you glad that you're not the preacher today? (laughs) Uh, So pray, pray for the preacher that he may give it to you straight from God's word. Today I'm not going to talk about the subject of which war to engage in. I'm going to talk really only on the question of is it honorable to serve as a Christian in the military? Two different questions. So how would you answer these questions? Well, in all cases, we must pray. We must claim the promises of James chapter 1. If any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who generously gives to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. What a precious promise. So let's do that right now. Join me as I pray. Precious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you for the magnificent, the all-powerful, the gracious and the loving God that you are. We thank you for the wonderful freedom, the peace, the security which we so richly enjoy in this great country of ours, America the beautiful, home of the brave, land of the free. Lord, we pray now that you will give us today an even greater perspective and a deeper appreciation of the honorable role of the soldier serving in the military. We thank you that in your word you have spoken clearly. You have not stuttered. Open our ears, open our hearts to receive anew your word today. We pray this now in the strong name of Jesus, who alone is mighty to save. Amen. Amen. Alvin C. York, Sergeant York, was an American World War I hero. He was awarded the Medal of Honor for leading an attack on a German machine gun nest taking out 32 machine guns, killing 28 German soldiers and capturing alive 132 other soldiers. Who has seen this great movie with Gary Cooper playing the part of Sergeant York? Did you know that Sergeant York was a pacifist? He was in great travail in his soul whether or not he could pull the trigger. He was a crack shot and a top squirrel shooter. He had been a hell raiser all of his life. And then he went through a dramatic conversion. He wondered, as a strict biblical Christian, could, a, could he put a man in his sights and pull the trigger? Good Christians around the world. I know I lived in Europe a lot, uh, Switzerland and Spain and uh, Germany. Uh, good Christians differ on the answers to these questions. In our country, you know, the most famous pacifist groups are the Amish, the Church of the Brethren, the Mennonites. 
But I pray we would be like the Bereans today on this subject. who are commended for being more noble. Why were they commended? Acts chapter 17. The reports that when they, when they heard the word preached with all eagerness... They examine the scriptures daily to see whether it was true. Really doesn't matter what I say or really doesn't matter what anybody says. What does God's word say? Whether or not someday you become one who may has to pull the trigger or whether you're one of those back home who provides the warrior love, the care, and the support, you may be asking the question, what does the Bible teach? about the military and the use of deadly force. I first began to to wrestle with this question as a young lieutenant 100 years ago uh, with my brand new shiny pilot swings fresh out of Air Force pilot training. I went off to George Air Force Base in California to learn to fly and to fight the F-4E Phantom. Talk about a lethal weapon. The Gatling gun fires 6,000 rounds per minute, 100 rounds a second. Load up a Phantom with wall-to-wall conventional 500-pound bombs. You can deliver twice the firepower of a B-17 bomber from World War II. While out there in tactical fighter pilot school in California, after they taught us to drop conventional weapons... Believe it or not, they began to teach us to deliver unscheduled early sunrises. Your hard-earned tax dollars trains us to deliver tactical nuclear weapons. I'll never forget, one of these bombs was called the Dr. Pepper bomb. For us a little bit older, remember Dr. Pepper had three numbers, 10, 2, 4. This bomb had a dial of yield on that corresponding to those three numbers. That's the Dr. Pepper bomb. We're talking about kilotons of devastating, lethal firepower. Doesn't the Bible say, thou shalt not kill? Well, after serving as a fighter pilot, I became a chaplain. People see my uniform and they often do a double check, you know, pilot, chaplain, pilot, chaplain. I became a chaplain in the Air National Guard. This is a photo of me serving over in Kyrgyzstan two summers ago. As a chaplain, you're officially a non-combatant. However, back before that, when I wore the flight suit as a fighter pilot, um, if I had ever been ordered to kill an enemy pilot in just war, under lawful authority, I would have obeyed and pulled the trigger. You know, I used to pray the warrior's prayer from King David. Psalm 144. Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. It's interesting, in the F-16, we talked about playing the piccolo. Because, as you can see, the stick and throttle from the F-16 are just bristling with switches and knobs to control all of the weapon systems and the radar. My nickname in those days was Magnum. And in the early 80s, a new TV show came out. They changed it to Magnum IP, instructor pilot. Um, we used to practice um, air defense in northern Italy, Aviano Air Base. The Italians in those days were our training aides. They would come in and attack our field. Uh, If they got through our defenses, they could blow the base to smithereens. So one day, um, my wingman and I were sitting air defense alert. All of a sudden, the klaxon sounds. You know what a klaxon sounds like? It's a very loud horn. Attention all alert crew. Scramble, scramble, scramble. You sprint to the jet. Start the engine. You taxi out. Cleared for takeoff. Full afterburner. You reach 500 miles per hour at the end of the runway. You pull up to 45 degree pitch attitude. You strap to a rocket, climbing like a homesick angel. Radar control calls you. Bandit, incoming. He's hostile. 20,000 feet, range 20 miles. 
You're passing 15,000 feet. Targets locked on. Fox 2. Missiles away. One starfighter destroyed. Mission accomplished. King David, a mighty warrior, a friend of God, and a man after God's own heart, wrote, Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Now comes the question, where does government get the authority to muster the military and to send men and women, soldiers, into harm's way? The scriptures teach that God has ordained that the soldier be given a terrible swift sword to put fear and terror into the hearts of wicked men who would desire to harm you. That soldier may be the only one to stand between you and the likes of some very wicked men like Al-Qaeda or the Taliban. The soldier's calling, according to the scriptures, is a noble and fully blessed by God calling. We need to honor the policeman, the soldier, and the airman. They are the ones who have stepped forward to lay it down, to serve as ministers of God to protect us from wicked men. So how do soldiers fit into the big picture in God's plan? You know, the Bible teaches that God is a gracious, loving God, and he's given us gifts. Unfortunately, we abuse most of the gifts that God gives us. But he is still a loving God. Three institutions that are gifts from God. I want to briefly look at those, and then we'll see how they all work together. These institutions, like I said, are given from the heart of God and his great wisdom to maintain order, promote peace and prosperity in your life today. Each of these institutions has a unique role to play. The first institution is the home. In Ephesians 5, uh, we're given instructions of how all that's supposed to work. It's a tremendous blessing, and it can be tremendously abused. I was so blessed to grow up with a loving, godly family. And some of the pilots I fly with today, their lives are just a train wreck. And you get to know them a little bit and hear their story. It all goes back to the home. The second uh, gift from God is the church. Okay, this is an amazing thing that the infinite God of the universe has commissioned us who know the Lord to be his ambassadors, his representatives. You have the ability as a believer to impact lives for time and eternity. The third institution is the government. Do we always get it right? No way. But what is the government all about? You know, in the scriptures, uh, the soldier is always honored and respected and held in the highest regard. Jesus knew at least two centurions. He once healed a centurion's son. Paul knew at least one soldier. Peter knew at least one soldier. But never once can you read in the scriptures that Jesus or Peter or Paul ever said to the centurion, Lay down your sword. Take off your shield and protective armor. Never once were they told to beat their swords into plowshares. That day is still future. But for now, God has ordained human government. Let's just look a little more closely at the passage that Ellen read for us. Romans 13, 1 through 4. God's word. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God... Those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror for good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise for the same. Okay, here's the verse. For he, who is he? In context, I believe he's talking about The policeman, the soldier, is God's minister. You recognize the little word there from the Greek, diakonos. To you for good, if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices 
evil. Did you know that policemen and soldiers are in the ministry? Next time you see soldiers in the ministry or policemen, you can say thank you for serving in the ministry, according to the scriptures. What does the verse say? The soldier is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on the one who practices evil. What is it that we should most expect from government? It'd be nice if they paved the streets, but we can live without that. It'd be nice if they had school for our kids, but we can probably do a better job homeschooling. What we need from government is to be a terror to wicked men. I want to be able to jog down my street in the dark of night and not fear wicked men. Amen. Amen? Wicked men either inside or outside of our borders should be made to fear the wrath of God. My friends, you can sleep safe and secure at night because of the brave ones in uniform who are willing to lay down their lives to protect you from wicked men. The military should be a terror. It should hold the devastating potential of lethal firepower, not for those who live righteously, but the one who does evil. This is God's idea, not ours. Um, the, the text is saying, if a wicked man chooses to do evil, he should be afraid, for the soldier does not bear the sword in vain. Those guns, rifles, the police and our warriors carry, they're not plastic metal toy guns. They're not decorative, non-functioning guns to make the soldier look pretty in a parade. They're capable of taking a man's life. Devastating firepower. Their intent is to make the perpetrator of evil shake in his boots. The evil man must be made to fear. The terrible swift sword is a deterrent to a wicked man. Did I tell you this was going to be a difficult sermon? But we must preach the full counsel of God. Let's just look at one of the creeds of the soldiers. Every branch of service has a different creed. This one's from the Air Force. Um, I'm a warrior. I'm an American airman, guardian and freedom, guardian of freedom and justice, my nation's sword and shield, its sentry and avenger. See how that tracks with Romans? The soldier is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Wickedness, you know, is high treason against Almighty God. That's when a puny little man, a little gerbil, a little sand flea, tiny little sand flea stands on God's good earth, breathes God's good air, that that rebel who enjoys the benevolence and the goodness of God should shake his fist in the face of Almighty God. That wicked rebel commits high treason. The wrath of God, the outrage of God, the holiness of God must be reckoned with. So when in biblical history did this thing, human government, we don't always get it right, but when did it start? Um, Long before the law of Moses and still in effect today. Genesis chapter 9, verse 5 and 6. For those of us who serve in uniform, we should be very familiar with these two passages, Genesis 9 and Romans 13. <clears throat> what does God's word say? From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. From his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man shall by man shall, but shall, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. That's the origin of politics. That's the origin of the police department, the origin of the military. Do we always get it right? No way. That's why, you know, in the Old Testament, the king was required to read God's word every day. Uh, God's truth, as we know, applied in God's ways, brings God's blessing and peace. You know, it's a scandalous thing 
when a father in a home breaks his covenant vows. It's a scandalous thing when a pastor takes a nosedive into sin. The Psalms speak of the scandal when leaders forget they are accountable to God. It's a scandalous thing when the military abuses its power. It shakes the very foundations of society. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Back in the Cold War days, back when I had some hair, I used to light my hair on fire and go out and race around Europe as a fighter pilot in the F-16. My, fi- my F-16 uh, fighter squadron was in Madrid, Spain. That squadron, there were three squadrons on base, but my squadron had 30 fighter pilots. Eight of us were strong, committed Christians. Do you know I believe that strong, committed Bible-believing Christians can make one of the, some of the world's best warriors. Why do I say that? Because when hard moral decisions in the fog of war come, and they will, those hard decisions will come. Christian fighter pilots, Christian soldiers, Christian warriors can rely both on the Word of God and the Spirit of God to guide them with divine wisdom. Amen? Amen. God was the one who ordained human government. God was the one who ordained this all as a gift for the peace and security in our culture. From his fellow man, I will require reckoning for the life of man. That's human government. Now, there's a huge difference in the scriptures between killing and murdering. We need to be clear on this. Fortunately, most of our translations now have it correct. What's the difference between killing and murdering? Two or three weeks ago, when Gaddafi allegedly was shot by that rebel, was that killing or was it murder? There's a huge difference there. Murder is when you lie in wait for someone to slay them because of your own selfish and wicked desires. Killing is something entirely different and done only in a just cause under lawful authority. So how's all this supposed to work? How do these three institutions, all gifts from God, ordained by God, work together? It all starts with the home. What's the purpose of the home? That Italian Old Testament prophet, what's his name? Malachi, Malachi. Malachi 2.6. What does God desire from parents? To raise up godly offspring. A new baby is born. The child comes into your home. You can take that little tyrant. That little hoodlum. That little sinner. And train him up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. I can say that because, you know, I was once a little tyrant. I was once a little hoodlum. And you know what? You were too. Fortunately, I had godly parents who loved me and followed the commands of Scripture to train up the child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. God has always commanded the parents primarily to teach the children the Word of God, not so much the Sunday school or the preacher or anybody else. It's the parents. We're familiar with Deuteronomy It says, uh, these words I've commanded you, teach them diligently to your children. I rise up and call my father and mother blessed because they taught me the word of God. They lived it out before me. Now, as parents working side by side with the pastors and teachers and mentors in the church, you can point that child to the Lord. Now that little boy, that little girl can grow up to learn to trust in Jesus and obey him. That child can be born again and begin to grow up in righteousness. That child can be forgiven and declared righteous in God's sight. But if that child chooses to rebel against mama and papa, if that child chooses to leave home and rebels against God, if that child chooses to act wickedly, Now he's going to have to deal with Dirty Harry. (laughs) So go ahead, make my day. Law enforcement, the police are a vital part of human government. 
a divine institution to maintain peace. Those serving in the military, the other part of the divine institution, if that child wants to go to another country, go crazy and terrorize the neighborhood, then noble warriors in the military are there to deal with that rebel in his high treason against God. What is the military all about? Thunder and lightning from on high. Amen. It is an institution ordained by God to secure our borders, to bless and to protect our nation. Our job as preachers, Christians, is to share the gospel, which is able to convert wicked men. We could bring a lot of folk up here to say, the gospel, the good news, converted me from one who hates to one who loves. But if a man uh, is able to flee away from that and reject God's love, they have to deal with Dirty Harry or Magnum IP. You know, my favorite adopted state is the state of Texas. My all-time favorite Western is Lonesome Dove. Amen? Amen? <laughs> Robert Duvall and Tommy Lee Jones. No one else will ever be able to make a worthy sequel to Lonesome Dove. Who has seen a Lonesome Dove? You haven't seen Lonesome Dove? How are you ever going to grow up and learn about the world? In that movie, Augustus McRae and Woodrow F. Call are Texas Rangers. Do you remember the scene when old Gus gets ready to send down on Blue Duck and his wicked brigands? Blue Duck leads a band of renegade bullies, similar in many ways to those bullies who are trying to, terrorists are trying to seek to destroy America. These are wicked, evil men. Blue Duck is a murderer, an abuser, and a slaver of women. Old Gus, the Texas Ranger, looks down in the valley. He sees the smoke rising from Blue Duck's camp. What does old Gus say? They don't know it, but the wrath of the Lord is about to descend upon them. Come some down. That Texas Ranger knew who he was. He knew that in this law-abiding land, you don't go about, kidnap women, abuse them, and murder their men. Old Gus knew that he was God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Can you be a Christian and serve in the military? Can you use lethal force in defense of your country? Is it a just cause? God must be obeyed. If the United States goes to invade Canada, under your watch, <laughs> um, there's some hard decisions to make. You can't do that. You must obey God first. But if the war is a just cause, then yes, it's a possibility of the shedding of blood. You're called to be God's minister. An avenger of wrath on the wicked man who practices evil. You're, pra- you're, au- you're, author- you're uh, acting under lawful authority. I'm very grateful to uh, Pastor Tommy Nelson of the Denton Bible Church in Texas for this sermon today. I've drawn heavily from his teaching on this subject. Tommy once had a workout partner in the gym he went to. And this workout partner of his was going into law enforcement. So he asked Tommy one day, he said, Preacher, would you pray for my 38? Have you ever seen anybody pray for a pistol before? Pastor Tommy says, and I quote, absolutely. He says, I put my arm around this policeman. I put my hand on the pistol and I prayed, Lord, someday this man may have to stand between me And the bad guy, I pray that you would let him shoot straight. We must pray the same thing today for our fine, brave warriors in uniform. When the day comes that these warriors need to lay it down, we must pray, dear Lord, may they shoot straight. Those soldiers may be all that stands between us and some pretty bad guys. 
Their duty, according to Psalms, defend the poor, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, free them from the hand of the wicked. Will there ever come a day when we don't need the military? The Bible says when Jesus Christ returns, we will study war no more. I love the old Negro spiritual. Going to lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside. Ain't going to study war no more, no more. In Isaiah chapter 2, the prophet writes of the future kingdom of the Messiah. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war and war. Brothers and sisters, we're not there yet. We're not yet in the glorious kingdom, the day of the millennial kingdom of Christ. But someday, maybe real soon, Jesus is coming back. Not as a helpless infant in the cradle of the manger, but as the almighty Lion of Judah. The Prince of Peace, the King of Kings. Meanwhile, the world remains a dangerous place. Our country is in desperate need and greatly indebted To the airmen, the soldier, and the marine. Those serving in the military have a high and noble calling to serve as ministers of the Lord in the service of our country. They wear the uniform proudly. Pray that the Lord would teach their hands to fight. So what about turning the other cheek? Let's look closely at that text. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. In the scriptures, there's a world of difference in how we act in the private realm of our daily lives versus how we should act under lawful authority as soldiers in war. What kind of slap is it if someone slaps you on the right cheek, on the back of their hand? It's a slap of contempt. If someone at your work or in your family or a friend has it in for you because you're a Christian, if they're out to persecute you, then don't be surprised. The scriptures tell us that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. How should you respond to that persecution, that ridicule, the contempt personally directed at you? Look at the verses that Alan read so well for us. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Repay no one evil for evil. If it is possible, as much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. We must follow the example of Jesus when they hurled their insults at him. He did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. In our personal relationships, in the work world, the kind and the loving and patient way in which we choose to respond to abuse, which is personally directed at us, can speak volumes to the persecutor and how much we love and care for them. Many a lost person has been loved Love to Christ, come to know Christ by a loving Christian who turned the other cheek. In the private and personal realm of your life, turn the other cheek, not the safety lock on your gun. Things that are different are not the same. In the military, we always talk about ROE. What's ROE? Rules of engagement. How much force are you going to bring to bear and when are you going to engage the enemy depends Totally on the situation at hand. These are two totally different ROE from the scriptures. One is for your personal private world. And one is in mortal combat under lawful authority. Two very different realms. Let's say in the middle of the night. Some wicked men like Blue Duck come down your street. They don't know you from Adam. But they arbitrarily begin to break into homes on your street. If you love your family, 
the Lord calls you to protect your family. Grab your rifle and lock and low. But if in the middle of the day, a co-worker, a lost family member, a friend decides to abuse you, to deride you, to call you names because you're a Christ follower, you take it graciously. The nature and the scope of the battle we are in can make all the difference in the world. The Bible has two totally different ROEs. Things that are different are not the same. So what are three applications we can take away? Has it been a heavy message today? Aren't you glad you didn't have to give it? (laughs) Um, Three applications today as we close. It's important to remember to give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord for these blessings of home, the church, and the government. Do we always get it right? No. But pray for the leaders of the homes, the church, and the government that they would be totally accountable to God. Give thanks to veterans. 11 a.m., the 11th of November, on the 11th month, 1919, was Armistice Day Treaty. We celebrate that today, giving honor to veterans and those who have served. Give thanks to the Lord for these institutions, for he is good, his steadfast love endures forever. We can pray for those who uh, serve us in all the branches of the service. You can pray for me, Peter the pilot. Uh, as we said, in a month or two, upgrade to captain. All right, there's a huge difference to move in your chair from here, three feet away to here. I'm upgrading to captain, 767. I'll be flying our brave warriors from the East Coast to and from harm's way. Um, and finally, for, especially for some of the young people, your whole life is ahead of you. What are we looking at here? What we call a 1040 window. This part of the earth is where there's been the most turmoil, the most unrest, and coincidentally, the most unreached with the good news of Christ. So calling can be to you to either serve in the military or serve in missions to reach people with the glorious, great news, life-changing power of Christ. In Isaiah prophet cries out, uh, whom shall I send and who will go for us? I said, here I am, send me. Have you read C.S. Lewis, Tales of Narnia? The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Mr. and Mrs. Beaver are telling the four children about Aslan the Lion. I love to hear this story, who represents Jesus. Susan asked the question about Aslan the Lion. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, says Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just plain silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he is good. He's the king, I tell you. Yes, for wicked men, God is not at all safe. But he is good. How do we know that? John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes, puts their trust in him, in Jesus the Savior, shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world through him might be saved. And all of God's people said, Amen.